Jeep wants you to spend over $100,000 drive away on this Grand Cherokee L Limited next to me. And this video is all about the question of whether this SUV is actually worth six figures. Now, as subscribers already know, Chasing Cars is owned by one of the big insurance companies here in Australia, Budget Direct. And that means we get to tell you how it actually is rather than taking ads from car manufacturers. So in this video, I'm gonna give you an honest look at the Grand Cherokee L, a new 2022 model for Jeep here in Australia. Now this vehicle is super important. Jeep has to get it right because they're trying to rehabilitate their image in Australia after the debacle of earlier versions of the old Grand Cherokee. So while I don't have a crystal ball about reliability of the new car, I can certainly tell you how it performs both on road and off here in Australia and whether I think you should drop a hundred grand of your cash on this vehicle or whether there's another SUV in particular that you should buy instead. Now, as usual, we'll go through the interior, the back seat, the third row and the boot of this car. We'll discuss the running costs and what this uh, 3.6 litre petrol V6 is going to cost you day to day. We'll drive the thing and then I'll give you my verdict about whether you should buy one. But before we get started, hit subscribe and hit the notification bell. Here around the back of the Grand Cherokee L, it's still a handsomely styled vehicle, although I think it probably looks its best from the front and sort of front side angles. You can let me know what you think of the design down below in the comments. They have kept it relatively simple. You get your Jeep badge. It doesn't actually say Grand Cherokee here because it says it on the front doors instead, but we know it's a limited and we get our L 4x4 badging down here. Now there will be the shorter wheelbase version of the car coming later with a plug-in hybrid, but for now the long wheelbase is all you can get. Power tailgate is included, beeps all the way up. Wouldn't want someone to bump their noggin. And it opens up to reveal a pretty generous amount of space with all seven seats up. So there's 478 liters of space this way. Carpeted nicely, a bit more storage underneath the boot floor as well. And we have an underslung spare with this car. In terms of extra storage, a little bit of a cubby, some hooks, 12 volt socket, etc. And then dropping down those third row seats, is a manual affair, but a fairly easy one. However, it is a bit of a stretch into the boot to bring them up. I do think for six figures, these should be power operated though. However, in five seat mode, this vehicle has over 1300 liters of space, Jeep claims, which certainly sounds like a lot. Jump inside what is a pretty good looking SUV and you find an all new interior for the WL Grand Cherokee, which is quite different to the WK generation that came before. In fact, the car is all new under the skin. However, that engine is carryover. We'll come back to that later. Now, there are three variants to choose from for now in the Grand Cherokee here in Australia. There's a base Night Eagle, which has sort of like half leather, half suede seats inside and like a six speaker stereo. There's the Limited in the middle, which I'm driving here, which has got a little bit of optioning sort of further added to it. And at the top of the range there is the Summit Reserve. Now, Poncho already looked at the Summit Reserve and you can see that video on the channel. Today, I'm looking at the more affordable mid-specification Limited, which is about 89 grand, or as it sits here, just over $100,000 drive away in New South Wales, Australia. So, what do you get inside? Well, you get an interior which visually is really quite presentable. You immediately take in this leather lined dashboard, which is really nice. Leather up here, kind of on the center console, even if the materials on the door tops are not quite as nice. There is the veneer of open pore wood here on the dash. It's not real, but it's a decent looking simulation. It looks nice. And, you know, we've got quite a chic black leather interior. We've got a big sort of truck-like steering wheel with contrast stitching and a bit more of that sort of wood trim in it and lots of technology and also lots of buttons. So if you don't like stuff being buried in screens, this is an SUV for you because you've still got a volume knob, temperature controls, seat heating and cooling, steering wheel heating. You can sort of control everything via buttons or via the 10 inch Uconnect touchscreen here and you've got a digital driver's display as well. So the basics are all here and Jeep has worked on material quality. So things like this rotary shifter down here feels cold to the touch and has sort of heavy damping to it. So it does feel like a quality item. However, it doesn't extend to everything that you see. The first problem is that this car, which only has 3,600 kilometers on it, the piano black surfacing is already all scratched up. Fingerprints you can wipe off, scratching, you can't do anything about it. And this car's got to live for, you know, 100,000 Ks or more as family transport. And at 3,000 Ks, 
it's already looking a little bit tired inside. And then there's stuff like the stalks, which just don't quite look or feel luxury grade. And they're the kind of things you have to touch all the time, along with the steering wheel, which Jeep says is covered in what they call techno leather. I don't know if that means vinyl or if techno leather is some kind of techno animal hide, but it just doesn't have the creamy feel of something like a Volvo XC90 or an Audi Q7 or a BMW X5, which this car is sort of targeted at. Price-wise, it sits between a top-end mainstream car and a bottom-end luxury car, so you're kind of looking for elements here to be punching up into that luxury space. Now, it doesn't take you too long to look to find sort of scratchy plastics. I know a lot of you guys say that you don't spend your time rubbing plastics in cars, which is fair enough, but just looking for kind of soft knee pads here for long drives is something that I usually do as the possessor of long legs. Now, moving on further, the Limited has a nine speaker Alpine stereo system, which certainly sounds decent, but not great. And that's probably because Jeep wouldn't want it to be too good so that they can walk people up to the Summit Reserve grade, which has a 19 speaker Macintosh stereo, which Ponch says is brilliant and I believe him. We are sitting under a sunroof here, and that's because this car has the Vision Group option pack, which adds that, you get a heads up display, and you get a fairly creepy feature called Fam Cam, which allows you to spy on your children from right here in the touchscreen. You can see what they're doing on their phones. It feels a bit American to me, but I guess that's something which could be useful if you've got rat bags for children. And as for the seats, they're a mixture of vinyl and leather, and that's kind of how it feels. They're a little bit slippery, they're a bit flat, they don't hold you in all that well in the corners, so it's better to drive this car gracefully. Could use a little bit more seat base length for longer legs, could use a little bit more seat thigh angle adjustment, but all in all, I was able to get comfortable enough. Again though, Summit Reserve gives you more ways of power adjustment for the seat, and also quilted leather, so they might be a little bit more comfortable. So, bit of a mixed bag up front. I'm not entirely sure the quality is quite up to $100,000, but it's livable and it's easy to use thanks to the good quantity of buttons to control key functions. So that's the front seat. Let's check out the second row now. Where the Grand Cherokee is immediately better than a full drive like the Toyota Land Cruiser Prado for your family is that it's a unibody vehicle rather than a body on frame truck. And that means that Jeep can get the floor a lot lower, so your feet are lower, your legs are supported by the base of the seat. If you're in something like a Prado or a full fat Land Cruiser, you feel like your legs are at about that position, which is not comfortable for long drives. The Jeep doesn't have that problem. In fact, what it has is a lot of space in the second row. Legroom's really good behind my own driving position. Headroom is fine, even though this car has the panoramic sunroof. Shoulder room's okay, although it's perhaps not as wide a vehicle as you might expect, and that's partially because in America, Jeep sells larger vehicles than this. They've got the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer, which sits above the Grand Cherokee L, and those are wider vehicles. So in terms of fitting three people across, you can do it, but it's just not as generous as you might expect. In terms of goodies back here, we've got air vents, we've got seat heaters for the outboard seats. If you go for the Summit Reserve, you even get seat coolers in the second row, which is pretty special. You get fan control, temperature control, this car has 12 USB ports. Some of them feature back here. And we even have one of my favorite features, a household PowerPoint in the back, which is pretty cool. You can draw 150 watts out of that. Now, soft material is still here in the back seat, inbuilt sun blinds, so you don't need NAF aftermarket ones, and a flip down armrest with two cup holders, map pockets in the back of the seat. So it's pretty fully featured. You can make more room for those in the third row because the seats are on sliders. You can recline actually really far back in these seats. So I actually like the second row of this vehicle more than I do the first. Nice relaxing place for road tripping with comfy seats. But what about the third row? I'm gonna put myself back there now so you can see just how generous it is for someone of my six foot height. One thing I wish Jeep had have corrected before I jump into the third row is that the curbside access has the big heavy part of the 60-40 split rear seat. The Toyota Kluger is also made in America like this car, but Toyota cared enough to make the small part of the backrest the curbside for right-hand drive, which is quality attention to detail. In the Jeep, you just get the big piece no matter if it's left or right-hand drive. Thankfully though, it is spring-loaded so kids probably, I don't know, 12 and up will be able to move that without too much of an issue. And then the aperture to get through into the back 
is one of the best I've ever seen. And then it is nice and easy to reset that second row. And hopefully you can see that it is adult size back here, which is really good. So my legs aren't too high. Headroom, I've actually got a couple of inches. You can get a second person back here just fine. There's actually four more USB ports here in the third row. We've got air vents, we've got airbags, and of course we have the El Creepy surveillance camera as well. So no shenanigans in the back of the Grand Cherokee L. So all in all, this is actually one of the better third rows in the industry. It's just that I wish the smaller part of the curbside access was set up for Australia and right-hand drive, because this is a slightly heavy piece for small kids to lift. So what is the new Grand Cherokee L really going to cost you to run? Well, the first cost is going to be petrol, and that's because this vehicle is only available with a 3.6 litre Pentastar petrol V6 engine without any turbocharging. The old Grand Cherokee you could have with a diesel and you could have it with two different V8s, one of which was kind of the Comfort V8 and one was the Bonkers Trackhawk engine, but Jeep have carried over probably the worst of those engines, which is the 3.6 liter V6. Now the issue with it is, as we'll find when we drive the car, it's not that quick and it's very thirsty. Jeeps say it will do 10.6 liters per 100 Ks. I have babied the car and the best I've been able to get out of it is 13.5 liters per 100 Ks. Once you put your kids and all their crap into the back of this car, it's gonna be 15, and that is seriously prodigious thirst in the year 2022, where petrol prices are above $2 a litre. It does have a 104 litre fuel tank, which is very useful, so the range of the vehicle is still good, despite the high fuel consumption, but it does mean that filling this thing up is gonna cost you over $200 at a time, which is kind of confrontational. Now, the warranty on the vehicle is five years and 100,000 kilometers, and that's okay, but like every rival gives you five years with unlimited kilometers, so what gives? And it's a similar story when it comes to servicing, which is required every 12 months, but every 12,000 kilometers, whereas virtually every rival vehicle lets you do it every 15,000 kilometers. So it's just these little things that keep adding up to make it a little inconvenient. Thankfully though, it does have cap price servicing for the first five years and 60,000 Ks, and each of those annual services is only gonna cost you $399 in that time, which is fairly reasonable, and it can take 91 octane fuel, so at least it doesn't require premium. Lastly, in the last 12 months, the median budget direct customer has spent $1,339 to comprehensively insure a new Jeep Grand Cherokee. Everybody's situation varies, and your premium will vary based on things insurers take into account like where you live and your driving record. So then, what is the big beast of a new Jeep Grand Cherokee L like to drive? Well, my thoughts are a bit of a follow-up to Ponch's impressions, and he spent a lot of time on high-speed country roads and also off-road with the Grand Cherokee L recently, particularly in the Summit Reserve trim. I've spent most of my week using the Grand Cherokee L Limited as most Aussie buyers will, which is commuting to and from work, using it for chores on the weekend, driving up to the beach on Sunday, you know, really pushing the car into regular family service. And here's what I found. This is a comfortable and serene car to drive in town. It rides well even if you don't have the air suspension that you get on the Summit Reserve model. There's an underlying firmness to the passive dampers and steel springs that you get on the Night Eagle and this Limited, but it's never truly uncomfortable and it almost always manages to avoid being crashy in everything but kind of repeated potholes of which there's a lot in Sydney at the moment after like eight months of rain across every surface type apart from that kind of really difficult ripped up pavement that continues for sort of five seconds the grand cherokee l feels comfy and well set up for our roads at least from a ride perspective and it's even a moderately keen handler certainly more so than a vehicle like a land cruiser prado can't tell you yet what the ford everest is like to drive but that strikes me as an interesting alternative for people that really loved their grand cherokee with the diesel engine because of course the only choice under the bonnet as i've now made quite plain is the naturally aspirated pentastar petrol fed v6 and the engine is i would say the weak spot of the grand cherokee l particularly at this price point it's an engine that's been around in Chrysler, Jeep, Stellantis now products for a long time. It was the base engine in the 300C current generation. It was in the old Grand Cherokee. We've seen it around a lot. It's a venerable engine. That does mean it's tried and tested, which is a good thing. But 
it's not really up there with like a Toyota or a Lexus V6 in terms of silken quality engine note, you know, NVH. It's reasonably grainy actually as an engine to listen to while you're accelerating and it's not as smooth as the best V6s out there. That being said, it does make more noise and a better noise than a four cylinder if we listen now. You know, it's quite raspy, it's quite good to listen to. It's just that if you jump into like a Kluger with a V6 engine, that's a better sounding motor in my opinion. And it's also a motor that makes more power and torque because the outputs are starting to look a little modest now for an engine of this size and consumption. 210 kilowatts of power and 344 newton meters are certainly okay. And I actually did do controlled performance testing on the Grand Cherokee L at our test track. And I was able to put down an 8.25 second zero to 100 time, which isn't bad. It's just that other companies are advancing in the kinds of engines they're using to make similar performance. The Kluger is available with a really frugal yet punchy petrol electric hybrid engine. Many competitors are still available with more frugal and torquey turbo diesel engines in four or six cylinders. And of course, you know, there were the old V8s that you could get on this car. And the sad thing is, is the V8s actually didn't really use more petrol. So at the moment, I'm averaging 17.3. We have been using the car up and down our test track today for photography and performance. So my average around town and with a bit of high speed uh, sort of highway work thrown in was 13.5. And honestly, a V8 wouldn't use much more than that, and it would be substantially torquier than this engine. And the old diesel will be missed, which was one of the reasons why a lot of Australians like to tow with the old Grand Cherokee. Later, the short wheelbase version of this car with five seats will arrive, and one of the engines for Australia will be a plug-in hybrid. But that's not really a replacement for the diesel. It will be nice to have you know, some urban range on electric only power that will give the Grand Cherokee more bandwidth for sure, but it won't be a replacement for the diesel for towing because plug-in hybrids, once they exhaust their battery, become relatively modest in terms of power. They lose any you know, significant contribution from the electric motor most of the time. So those are my thoughts on the engine situation. I don't think it's great. Now, the torque from the engine goes to all four wheels via Jeep's Quadra Track 1 system, all drive system, in the Night Eagle and in the Limited. This is essentially an all wheel drive like system. You have to go to the Summit Reserve grade, which is a lot more expensive, if you want Quadra Track 2, which is very different to Quadra Track 1 because it has a low range transfer case, so you can do much more serious off roading in that car with easier traction. However, it strikes me as slightly odd that you have to choose the most plush Summit Reserve trim with like body colored bumpers and huge 21 inch wheels to get the best off-roading tech. Wouldn't it make sense to have a Trailhawk model with chunky tires and small wheels? Maybe Jeep will do that in future. Lastly, a word on NVH that the road noise is relatively high in this vehicle and I've noticed a few other reviewers have picked up on that too. Perhaps it's because the rear windows aren't glazed on any grade apart from the Summit Reserve. That's just one thing I picked out. However, you do get a whole suite of adaptive safety tech, including lane keep assist and adaptive cruise. Though I have driven cars which have stronger lane keep so that when you're on a highway and you just want to relax, they're happy to take over more of the mental task than this vehicle. So what are my final thoughts on the new Jeep Grand Cherokee L? Well, to be honest with you, I think this vehicle has a bit of an identity crisis. It's a handsome truck. I think it looks good. It has that Americana styling that I think works on a vehicle like this. But when it comes to the question of dropping a hundred grand on this vehicle, it just doesn't feel premium enough to get there in my books. The powertrain is the dregs powertrain of the Grand Cherokee lineup. We need to get that three litre twin turbo petrol engine that America is gonna get to make this car feel sufficient at six figures in my opinion. And as for the interior, it's okay, but there are elements of like a Hyundai Palisade Highlander, which are considerably nicer than this Grand Cherokee Limited, and that Hyundai is a lot cheaper. Now, some will say, okay, well, Jeep's a premium brand. And the answer to that is that something like a Volvo XC90, which is now very much tried and tested and in its final year of production in second generation form, is a better luxury SUV for $100,000. So I'm left not really knowing where the Grand Cherokee fits into the landscape here in Australia. If it was given a better engine, 
a higher specification and a slightly sharper price, then it would be a great rival to top-end Kias and Hyundais. Alternatively, if it was given a better engine and a little bit more refinement and acquired a cabin, then it would be a competitor for entry-level luxury stuff like a Genesis GV80. So in terms of whether you should buy one, I'd be waiting until Jeep gives this vehicle the engine Australia deserves. Keen to know your thoughts though, so let me know down below the video in the comments. While you're there, make sure to hit subscribe and the notification bell. And as always, thank you for watching Chasing Cars.